Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Building the Rack Stack, packaging from Upstream OpenStack. I'm Philip Schwartz. I'm a senior developer for the build, release, and deployments team at Rackspace. I'm Kevin Mitchell. and I'm also uh, a developer at the uh, build, release, and deploy systems at Rackspace. All right, so we have a couple objectives for this as a whole. We're going to talk about the evolution of our packaging of OpenStack inside of Rackspace, the process that we're using for packaging, and the future of the actual process. This here is a just overall view of what our team does and the different pieces that go into it from a high level area. In this actual talk, we're going to talk about a couple things. We're going to talk about our interactions with Git in order to build packaging, our ply tool that was created by Racker that is designed for doing patch management, and also the packaging system itself. What we're not going to cover in it is any of our deployments and actually are the targets of the deployments. We're only talking about the object of what we deploy. So let's go ahead and get to the packaging context itself. All right, so uh, we started off with uh, creating uh, Debian packages. We actually had uh, one repository on our internal GitHub that had uh, the metadata directories for all of the packages that we built. And then we just uh, copied out the, uh, say, the Nova package, plunked in the uh, Debian uh, directory for that particular Debian package, built it, locally installed it uh, using the Debian package manager, used the local app repository. That's about it. Of course, we had uh, some problems with that in that uh, it was rather disruptive. So then we went on uh, to the next page. With this, we moved to a more monolithic package. It was something that contained all of the projects, Nova, Glance, at the time, Quantum and Melange, all configurations which were puppet-based at the time. It uses virtual environments, no site packages at all, so it's completely self-contained. They were built all on a single Jenkins slave and were copied around from system to system. It's a horrible thing to think about. Everyone tells you do not move virtual environments around, but there is a little bit of benefit to it. It's still maintained using local storage. We also moved to using torrenting to actually deploy the package in a staging method to all of our actual systems, along with HTTP for downloads too. And we'll move on to our build flow itself, which is kind of interesting when you see most code. Most times you see people pull down an actual repository, they'll make changes to it, they'll use it for deployment or anything that's necessary. We go a little bit beyond that. We use the tool apply to merge a local repository that stores nothing but patches to Git inside of it. As part of that flow, we would then branch and tag based off of it, build the, the actual virtual environment, run complete unit tests on it, and compress the virtual environment and store it off as an artifact to be used later. So why did we uh, move virtual environments around? Uh, simple answer, allowed for finite testing. We create the virtual environment, then we take the virtual environment, and we run the unit tests for that uh, product. So we, we create a virtual environment for Nova. We create a separate virtual environment for Glance that avoids uh, conflicts. Um, but then we can take that single virtual environment, run the unit tests on it, validate that all the unit tests pass. It's kind of a, a last sanity check that, uh, yes, everything's working fine. And then we uh, either deploy it into production or we employ it, uh, deploy it into our uh, production staging environment, uh, where we you know, run various uh, functional and integration tests to validate that, yes, the unit tests aren't lying. This actually works. So creating this monolithic package actually is a pretty interesting process. It's done completely automated via some code. It actually grabs from the local storage all of the virtual environment artifacts pulls down a configuration repository. It creates an actual versioned and compressed archive that we then move to the storage server. It's basically a large tarball of nothing but virtual environments. And it works pretty well at the time. This here is a base flow of what we actually do with the actual build. I'm Sorry for it being a little blurry. It's not on the laptop. <laughs> um, we start by creating the actual branching of the repository and doing tags and everything is needed. We then build the actual virtual environments, running full unit tests on them. We build the deploy artifact, and then we store the actual deploy artifact into the storage server. <coughs> Sorry about that. So this is basically just the same thing in 
text uh, as it was from the scribe before. So there are some issues with this current system that we are using, and this is where it is. There's two main ones that we've come into. All projects must be upgraded together. You can't upgrade them separately. It means anytime we do an actual Nova deployment, we're doing a Neutron deployment. At the same time, Glance is being deployed, so we always have to test everything and verify that they're working. We also have an issue with the torrenting that we were using where everything was limited per cell due to network restrictions. So when we would actually do the staging, we would copy the package out to each system cell by cell, which over time could take a long period of time, especially when you see that in Rackspace, we're currently running upwards of 144 cells in our production environment over six regions. So uh, where are we going? Well, <coughs> we're going to get rid of this uh, monolithic package. Mm. Uh, we've already started the process. We've uh, pulled Neutron out into its separate package. And just to be clear, that's a, a virtual environment and configuration, but none of the other systems. Uh, so it's not like our monster tarball. And we're uh, in the process of doing that for StackTac, which is a, a monitoring tool uh, and uh, ironic. Uh, and we intend to do that for Glance, and then eventually we'll actually pull Nova out uh, separately. As part of this, we're also changing how we're storing them and how we're actually staging these packages out. We're moving to using Swift to actually store the object, and we're using some custom Ansible modules to generate Swift temporary URLs, shard the actual um, artifacts across Swift containers, and then using those temporary URLs with Ansible to pull the package down to each of our systems, removing that entire restriction of one cell at a time. Well, this is the basis of the build flow and what it's actually changed. Not much has changed here, but you're able to see that we're now building separate, pack separate tarballs for each of the actual projects. All right, and uh, what do we use for actually building these packages? So the primary thing we use is a Jenkins server. We're actually uh, in the process of setting up multiple Jenkins servers because, well, Jenkins doesn't really scale. <laughs> We use uh, static slaves, uh, at least uh, originally, uh, to do this. But we've uh, since moved on to uh, setting up uh, Docker containers. So we launch, a, uh, we launch a Docker container, and then we uh, run uh, a tool inside of that, which actually builds the virtual environment, tars it up, puts it into an artifact store. And we do an, another one that uh, downloads that, runs the tests. Another one that downloads that virtual environment, sticks it into a monster tarball, and uploads that to an artifact store. Uh, so the actual uh, tools that we use, we use uh, Ply. If you're interested in that, it's uh, up on PyPy as Ply Patch, and that was written by uh, one of our rackers. Uh, we use the Python standard uh, virtual env, and we use pip. And uh, of course, we also have an internal build tool that we use. Um, it's what, uh, <laughs> 4,000, uh, yeah. 4,500 lines of code, yeah, 18,000 lines of unit tests, because we want to make sure that it actually works. Yeah, we've had, we've had a lot of people, when they've seen the code base, look at us, and they think it's completely crazy with the amount of tests that are there. But how we've seen it is this is a tool that we use, and we depend on for our production environment to verify that what we build, the virtual environments and these packages, and any way we actually do that will always work. So we're guaranteeing that when we build one of these, pack these actual packages, that the virtual environments will always be built in the same manner, will always function the same, and that they run exactly the same. It, the tool is completely Python-based. Again, it's just over 4,500 lines of code with 18,000 lines of tests to verify and control what it's doing. And that's a mixture of unit tests and functional tests. And we use full any-based configurations for it. Yeah, and uh, this tool handles more than just the packaging. Um, so uh, we have uh, pull requests internally. We maintain uh, Neutron, Nova, et cetera, repos on our internal GitHub, and then make pull requests to that. And this uh, project is also responsible for running the tests on that. So that means that uh, when we run the tests after generating the package, we know it's the exact same tests that were run when the developer uploaded their uh, pull request in the first place. Uh, so that gives us better confidence that it's uh, working. So. Uh, the way the tool works is it's uh, based around a Jenkins uh, environment, uh, Jenkins workspace. So it just runs as a Jenkins job. Uh, in fact, it gets the name of the Jenkins job, uses the any configuration to figure out what it's supposed to do. So the uh, build script for these is dot slash bootstrap. That's it. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we use uh, Git and Ply for uh, maintaining uh, upstream pulls, you know, pulling stuff down from upstream, merging it in with uh, our local patches, and um, putting it back into our internal repository. Uh, we do Git branching and tagging for leases. Uh, we use virtual environment creation using virtual env and pip. Um, this is an interesting point. Um, we, have, uh, well, we have a Neutron client right, on our uh, internal GitHub. And we want to use our version of it rather than the upstream version of it. We may have, had, uh, we may have found some bugs and fixes, fixed them, but haven't had a chance to contribute them upstream. Or maybe it's something that's uh, specific to our environment. So uh, the tool that we have actually parses the requirements files and finds these uh, overrides, is what we call them. And uh, we'll install the overridden package rather than the uh, upstream PyPy version. Um, we use uh, run test.sh to uh, run the unit test. This is an unfortunate limitation. Uh, Talks right now doesn't allow us to supply our own virtual environment. That, that work is in progress, uh, but it is not yet complete. So we have to use um, a shell script that uh, lets us say, hey, use my virtual environment. Um, we compress the artifacts using you know, tar, gz, stuff that you would normally use, um, create the packages, um, create a monolithic package, and now, of course, we're creating the, uh, the project-level packages. So the next step that we're going to from here is we actually are open sourcing this tool. It's a tool that's going to be called Striker. We're going to be making it available through a StackForge project. There are some changes that are coming down as we're doing it. It's still going to remain heavily tested. It's still going to be Python-based. We're moving to a more standard YAML configuration file setup with full schema validation for the actual YAML files. We're moving from using a Jenkins workspace to actually having a strong CLI so even developers can run this on their local system and actually use it. Part of this also is going to be moving to using talks as the upstream work is being done to fix it so we can give it an actual virtual environment to work with instead of generating one. One of the other things that we're doing right now is with the current tool, we have split out configurations. Each of our project level have level projects have a separate configuration. We're wanting to bring that down to where we can have a single, conf single configuration that can be used to define everything for the actual flow and how it works, where we want packages to go, how we want the artifacts to actually be built so we can control it. And this will be on StackForge. It's something we want to have out there for the community to use, because we know a lot of other companies, other teams, are solving this exact same problem and doing it. We've been doing it now for a little over a year, and we want to make sure that everyone else has the opportunity to try to learn from what we've done and possibly benefit from it. And one other thing that uh, we want to uh, accomplish with Striker is we want to uh, enable building packages that are not virtual environments. Maybe you want to use a, uh, a wheelhouse, you know, just a collection of wheels. Uh, so we want to have uh, the ability to uh, enable that kind of deployment, or at least that kind of uh, package building. Uh, a couple things that we want people to take away from our little talk here and what's going on is, as much as you have been told moving virtual environments around are bad, it's not as bad as it sounds. It gives you some very good benefits, specifically when it comes to testing and knowing what you're going to be using on your system. The idea of using a monolithic package, which though it worked, we ran into large issues where it actually caused problems, where it slowed down our actual releases because everything had to be working throughout it. And the other thing is that we are making Striker available. So it is something that other teams can build on and use to package OpenStack in a meaningful manner for their company itself. And at this time, we'd like to open the floor and ask if there's any questions, anyone has any questions specific to it. Hi. It looks good. We've, we've been using um, Anvil in-house, which uh, generates uh, distro packages, RPMs in their case. Um, why don't you generate um, distro um, .deb files or .rpms? We could. We had looked at it previously. It was actually what was used originally. It was all the code was stored in it when we would do local installs. We looked at the idea of continuing to do that to generate virtual environments and have them inside of the actual packages. And at the time, it, it just didn't seem like the best tool. Yes, we could push it out into an app repository, pull it down on our systems and use it. But then we have the overhead of managing more app repositories as they grow, as more packages are in there, instead of having just a singular package or a group of packages that are everything that's there, ready to go, that we can wget or copy directly instead of having to use system-level installs. And there's also the, uh, the problem of orchestration, right? When we're doing a deploy, and we promised we weren't going to talk about deploy, so this would be just a surface-level thing. When we're doing a deploy, we, we stage all these packages out there, 
then we, you know, come through and shut down some packages or shut down some services, uh, change the code over, bring them back up, and proceed on to the, the, the next step of that deploy. Um, when we have uh, a package going in, um, we may have the, the package manager helpfully start the service for us, and that kind of messes up with our coordination. Maybe we want to change that around. So. And the other thing is noted in that is when you are doing a deployment, if you're using the package manager, you have to pull it down at the time of deployment. We can't have things out ahead of time. And with our larger environments, with the growth that they've had, that would actually add a considerable time to when we would have possible downtime for customers while doing those deployments. Okay, but the, uh, the packet man package manager will give you uh, dependency resolutions and conflict management and those things. Are there any, um, any benefits that you can see of Striker over um, an approach like Anvil that um, we haven't just covered? The one advantage that we've seen with it, and we've even seen it in our own use, yes, you can get dependency resolution from the actual package manager. The problem is it's not always determinate how it wants to do things. If there's two packages with a similar version number or it's a, a letter in a different place in the actual version or something of that nature, you're never guaranteed exactly what you're going to get. You're going to have to always override and make sure that you have a newer version than what you've put into the package repository previously and newer than what might be available on the actual OS. So you can't truly control what version's coming down because if there happened to be an update outside of what you're wanting to do, the package manager will try to go for that unless you do pinning. And pinning in apt and yum is not always pleasant at times to do when it comes to deployments and things of that nature. With how we're doing it, building the virtual environments, controlling them, we're able to control every single version of a Python library that's going into that virtual environment to know that we've tested it and it works, and any system we put it on, it's going to function exactly the same. Your internal changes are hosted as patches in a repository that you reapply. What's the advantage of doing that rather than actually modifying the source? And do developers like patching patches? <laughs> developers <laughs> do not like patching patches. Patching patches at times can be very annoying. Sometimes you end up just rewriting the original patch in order to work with it. It gives a little some advantages to it. Normally, when you would have to do stuff, you would have your own branches, your own work maintained in there. And you would then have to do rebasing and pulling in the actual code in order to continue a workflow and then at the same time fix issues that came up. You still have to fix those same issues that come up when you're using the ply based method, but the advantage of it is you can have a repository of patches that are completely separate and smaller than maintaining a full repository with the code patched in it. So you're then able to have it act, the tool actually do the patching and just then verify that it got what you want and update as needed, so you don't need to maintain it. And why not using why not use an existing tool for patch management such as Quill or others that exist? I was actually going to uh, bring that up. Uh, the primary reason that we use uh, Ply as opposed to Quilt is Ply actually keeps the uh, patches in Git. So we have a Git history of all of the changes that have been made to the patches, which is not something that is uh, very easy to do with Quilt. Any other questions? Uh, our contact information one more time in case anyone has any questions and you guys get a little bit of time of your life back. <laughs>